Good morning. <laughs> All right. I'm Rebecca Dorge. I'm the provost at RPI. Um, I'm delighted to be surrounded by so many RPI alumni, parents, students, community members, and friends. It has just been an amazing um, past couple days and another day ahead of us. Uh, thank you all for being here. There's so much going on at RPI, and I, I certainly hope this weekend reconnects you to your time on campus as we celebrate 200 years of uh, RPI history. RPI has been at the forefront of innovation and research for a very, very long time. Today, I am thrilled to introduce three faculty members who will present their research through TED-type TED style talks. Um, and uh, at RPI, we call these talks Research, Education, and Discovery Talks, Red Talks. Our first speaker is Dr. Maurice Suckling, an assistant professor um, in the Games and Simulation and Art Sciences program in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Maurice has been publishing games since the 1990s. He also creates video and board games. His recently published book is entitled Paper Time Machines, Critical, Ga Paper Time Machines, Critical Game Design and Historical Board Games. His talk today, how to build a time machine. He will focus on how designers of historical games build machines capable of transporting their users to a different time and place, maybe 200 years ago. Please welcome me, join me in welcoming Dr. Maurice Suckling to the stage. Hello. An infinite number of mathematicians walks into a bar. <clears throat> the first one says, I'll have a pint, please. The second one says, I'll have a half a pint, please. The next one, a quarter of a pint, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-second, a sixty-fourth, a hundred and twenty-eighth. The bartender holds up her hands and says, hold on a minute, 256, they're still saying it out the door. Hold on a minute, she says, and she slowly pours two pints, pushes them to the front of the bar and says, now. Sort it out amongst yourselves. <laughs> and into the very same bar walks a time traveler who has never been there before. And the bartender asks her, same as usual? <laughs> this is what I want to talk to you about today, about how to build a time machine. Physicists, I hope I have your attention because this is much less impossible than you might think. So this summer, whilst playing Lego with my then seven-year-old daughter, she confidently told me she was building a time machine. This was poignant because we were visiting my brother in the UK at the time, and my brother is seriously ill. When she said this, I looked at him and felt he was wistfully thinking, exactly the same thing I was. That being able to travel back in time to a time when my brother's illness was not so advanced would be good. But neither of us said anything, we just let the silence resonate. And when the silence got too loud, I asked my daughter if she knew how her time machine was going to work. And she said, that isn't even the biggest question. The biggest question is who is going to fit inside it? <laughs> and I've come to think that my daughter is right, that ultimately, of course, imagination will power any good time machine. The real concern is who is going to operate it. So that's our first key ingredient. We need a suitable traveler. I recommend a human. I recommend someone who's not too tired, someone who has about two, three, maybe four hours to spare, and someone critically with the right mentality. The next four things we need are all rhetorical devices. They're ways of persuading our would-be traveler 
about what it is we want them to experience. The first of these is aesthetic rhetoric. This is about how things look, how they sound, and perhaps to do with tactility. It's nice and simple. There is a difference between being faithful to history, history as it was, or faithful to a history as your traveler expects it to have been, but we're going to gloss over this hugely significant and problematic topic. <laughs> There's a difference between accuracy, how things were, or authenticity, how things might plausibly have been, but we're going to gloss over this hugely significant <laughs> and problematic topic. There's also a difference between realist simulation, a specific stylistic representation, or conceptual simulation, which is a more abstracted representation. But we're going to gloss over this hugely significant and problematic topic. The point here is this, to make your game look and sound like the history you want your traveler to experience. Next, we have discursive rhetoric. This is about ensuring you surround your game with information about the history your design addresses. So it's information like game box art or systems text that's not directly related to the way that the game is played or advertising copy, trailers, and so on. It's about being adjacent to the game, but not the game itself. And this helps your traveler with motion sickness. <laughs> Next, procedural rhetoric. There's an important idea that simulations convey dynamic systems in process. And we can think of history and indeed life as a complex integration of dynamic systems in process, all of which means that simulation games are actually a highly suitable means for attempting to model history, life, reality. Bearing in mind that all models are wrong, but some are useful. With this rhetorical device, the point is that meaning is within and between the systems. The mechanic is the message, as game designers and game scholars like to say. Or the things you do are what it means. You can get a sense of what I mean with the ultimatum game, which economists here will know. It works sort of like this. If I am given $100, I make an offer to share it with someone else. And if they agree to my offer, we get to keep our respective portions. However, if they refuse, neither of us gets anything. We can play this now. Kim, would you like to play this game? OK, so I don't have, so I, this $100 is not mine. This is given to me. And I'm going to make you an offer. How about I keep $99 and you have one? You can just thumbs up and thumbs down. OK, so for the benefit of everyone else, so Kim refused the offer. Therefore, we both lost the game. We could try again. I keep 80, you have 20. OK, she's wavering. You're going to commit? OK, she's accepted. That's unusual. Thank you, but thank you very much. So, <laughs> but thank you very much for playing. In the context of the ultimatum game, procedural rhetoric is telling us some things. It's telling us that there are asymmetries of power. It's better to be the proposer than the responder. Also, in line with rational maximization, the system is telling us you should take the most you can because you can. And really, anything above zero is a win. So in a way, Kim, you made perfect sense. But there's more going on here, as economists know. And we're going to put a pin in this and come back to it in just a moment. With procedural rhetoric, the point is to ensure your games make players do things that convey meaning. In actual fact, everything that they do is conveying meaning. You just want to make sure it's closer to the meaning that you initially intended than anything else they derive from it. And in the context of history games, you want to ensure your games make players do things consistent with being historical actors. And finally, what I like to call experiential rhetoric. This is about ensuring your game makes players feel like they are time traveling through your use of image, through sound, through information surrounding the game that isn't necessarily the game itself and critically through the things they do. So we can think of experiential rhetoric as a useful collective term for these other combined rhetorical devices. Yet there's more going on here, because experiential rhetoric is a gestalt. It's more than the sum of its parts. 
Because with experiential rhetoric, it goes beyond the mechanic is the message of procedural rhetoric. It goes beyond it and gives us how you feel about what you do is the message. Or how rhetorical devices collectively make you feel is the message. And this is where we'll come back to the ultimatum game that we just played. As economists will know, proposers typically, or well, they typically offer between 40 and 50%. And responders typically, you're an outlier, Kim, reject anything below 30%. So that's how it normally uh, transpires. This is telling us two really important things. One is humans are complex, that there's more going on here than just economic rationalism. There's also a sense of altruism, the sense of perhaps a sense of justice, a fear of rejection, perhaps even projections over our dopamine expectations. And also, you know, social contexts as well have a bearing on why someone might accept or refuse or even make a certain offer at any time. But the second thing is critical, is telling us that, really demonstrating that playing a game demonstrates there is more to the game than beyond its just systems and its power structures. In the context of the ultimatum game, experiential rhetoric is asking us, how does it feel to play the game? And what it's telling us is how you feel, or what you feel when you're playing, you're winning, you're losing, is what the game means. You can play it and find out. You get that sense that there's more going on here than simply the results and the systems. There's a very short Franz Kafka story that uh, I want to share which I think perfectly conveys my point here. The story is called The Top, and it's about a philosopher. A philosopher who is so transfixed by watching a top, a child's top, spinning. He sees some children playing at a beach, and he goes and visits them every day and watches this top spinning. He's, he's mesmerized by it. And every day he gets closer and closer and closer to try and better understand this top's fascination for him until one day he gets so close to it that he picks it up, whereupon it stops spinning and he loses all interest in it. The point here is this, that if we think of simulation games as a process, we must bear in mind that these are processes in action. And if we think of history as a complex series of enmeshed processes, we could say that a relatively poor way of attempting to model history would be to write about it, Whereas a relatively more fidelitous way to attempt to model history would be to make games about it. Because when players are playing history, they're experiencing processes in action. They're experiencing the spinning of the top, when the spinning of the top is the most essential thing about it. So that's it. You need just five things. A suitable traveler, aesthetic rhetoric, discursive rhetoric, procedural rhetoric, and experiential rhetoric. And of course, if omnidirectional time travel from any point in time to any other point in time is ever going to be possible at any point in the future, then time travelers are already with us, which is why I waved to myself over there at the beginning of the talk, but <clears throat> I've, I've gone now. Thank you very much. told you we had amazing faculty. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suckling. Amazing.